Jesús es de uh, his PhD in Zaragoza with uh, Mario Floria and Javier Moreno. And then he went to Catania to work with Vito La Torre. And uh, okay, he went back to Spain where he got one of the, the, the Ramon y Cajal fellowships, which is a very prestigious fellowship in Spain. It's, uh, I would say, I mean, if I, don't, I don't want to make a mistake, but it's uh, the same type of the MacArthur Fellowship in the United States. And with that, using the possibility or the, the flexibility that the Ramon y Cajal Fellowship gives, he chose to work in the University of Zaragoza where he is now, and he has become recently full professor. And uh, he's also the recipient of the, of the prize, is a prize? Yeah. It's a prize of the, of the Royal Society of Sciences in Spain. Okay, well, he's going to talk to us about network epidemiology, a complex systems approach towards epidemic control. Okay, thank you very much, Jesus. Thank you very much, Hila, and thank you, everybody. Those that uh, are in the school knows me already, uh, have suffered me for a while. Um, for the others, well, I'm Jesus Gomez Gardenas from the University of Zaragoza, where I'm professor and uh, head in the Gotham Lab with this name, which is very, very catchy. Uh, what we do is obviously complex systems. I'm in the Institute of uh, Biocomputation and Physics of Complex Systems, and I was very, very happy, and uh, that's why I'm dressing this shirt, not only because it's very nice, but because among all the topics in theoretical physics, there is systems complexos, not only nonlinear dynamics. So, and this is, uh, I think this is a noteworthy thing that an Institute of Physics incorporate this as a, as, a, as a topic. And for those that are not physicists, that here there are some of you, let me explain for a little bit why a physicist is interested in epidemiology, for instance, no? which is the topic of today. Uh, well, physics tries, as you know, uh, to explain nature, the phenomena we observe, and translate this phenomena into mathematical laws that have the power of predicting what is going to happen, right? In my case, I was very attracted from the very beginning by statistical physics, which is a branch of physics in which you, ca you try to connect what we observe in the macro world, which is thermodynamics, with the micro world, which is just the forces and the, and pre the, the laws that govern these, uh, the, 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 the molecules and atoms, etc. So it's a very, very funny and interesting, uh, interesting area. Obviously, it has started very long ago. We have uh, from Boltzmann, Gibbs that finally make it practical. Also, Einstein contributed in the name of many body physics. Here we have a James that interpreted the power of statistical physics in terms of information theory, which is a topic of this school. And finally, we have the Nobel Prize Wilson uh, that developed the theory that explains critical phenomena. And in this theory, we can understand that microscopic details about models, about uh, our system are not so important as things as a dimension or interactions. And it was another Nobel Prize, which uh, appeared one year later. It was Philip Warren Anderson, another statistical physicist applied to condensed matter, who wrote a paper whose title was More is Different, which is something that in a statistical physics we know. I mean, when we have a gas, when we have a, some system composed of hundreds, millions, billions, trillions of molecules, we have behaviors that we don't expect by looking to single molecules. And he, he tried to extrapolate this into other uh, realms of science. In particular, let me read this, uh, this paragraph in which Anderson says that the behavior of large and complex aggregates of elementary particles is not to be understood in terms of simple extrapolation of the properties of few particles. Instead, at each level of complexity, entirely new properties appear. This means, this call it like symmetry breaking. I mean, at each level, at each scale, we have new properties, new symmetries for physicists that 
were not present in the lower scale. So we cannot use the simple aggregation. We have to try to develop theories and methods that are novel in order to capture new phenomena, emergent phenomena. And it's emergent phenomena, these collective properties that Anderson was mentioning in his paper are, for instance, this nice, not so nice because of Zoom, but nice movement of flocks in which seemingly these birds act in a coordinated way in which there are no central controller, no coordinator. Or, as is the topic of the school, the brain, in which we have this coordination of billions of neurons in order to develop cognitive processes, or communities of animals that develop a phenomena like cooperation, or societies in which we have a lot of collective phenomena, not only congestion, but also the spread of rumors, the spread of culture, etc. And here we are interested in epidemics. And epidemics can be also uh, studied under the lens of statistical physics, because at the end, you cannot understand an epidemic by, see, by looking simply a virus. The virus itself is very interesting, and it's very useful to, for instance, develop vaccines. But you have to look into a population level, the interactions in the population, to understand how an epidemic unfolds, right? And if you see this is watch a stomach flu, which is a virus, very, very infectious, by the way, takes America by storm. And it seems like it's a weather forecasting, right? I mean, you start with a virus and you see how it spreads. And this is the goal. Our goal nowadays is to be as good as weather prediction. Try to gather the important details of how disease communicate between hosts and try to develop, obviously, methods to control it. Okay, this is something this, which is normal nowadays. We can observe the trajectory of a hurricane and have a, a lot of information about what's going to happen in a few days, right? But this was a dream. I mean, this is Lewis Fry Richardson. He was one of the fathers of uh, weather forecasting. Before him, another, like Bernes, for instance, the prediction was just like artificial intelligence, okay? It was human intelligence. It was, okay, I have the map, okay, with the pressure, etc. I look back in time and check if there is another map which is similar. And then look what happened that day. And then you say, okay, if that day happened this, then probably tomorrow happened the same. And it was totally wrong, as we know today, because weather is highly nonlinear. Okay, he proposed for the first time a simple set of equations, which is basically thermodynamics and fluid dynamics, that he wanted to solve based on data captured days before. Okay? In his own words, this is perhaps someday in the dim future, it was 1972, sorry, 1922, it will be possible to advance the computation faster than the weather advances at, at a cost less than the saving due to the information gathered. But this is a dream. In fact, he tried. He tried to do it. He failed. And he imagined what was the human cost that he needed to solve these equations in a time faster than weather's. It was this picture. It's a Richardson forecast factory. He calculated 64,000 people calculating in parallel on trying to solve the equation based on the data he had gathered the days before. Okay? And in this sense, he would uh, succeed. But the very, very, very nice news arrived in the 50s, some years later, three decades later. And in the ENIAC, it was one of the first dedicated computers, he could, they could solve these equations 24 hours in 24 hours. Again, 24 hours in advance of the advance of weather. And they communicate this achievement to Richardson, who finally saw that his, his dream was not anymore a dream. Okay? So obviously, we have new equations nowadays. We have high-resolution data. We have super, super computers. And nowadays, it's so easy that I have in my phone the weather in Sao Paulo, the weather in Zaragoza, the weather in, weather in three, four days. And it's very, very accurate. Okay? Not only this, but also stream events are, can be captured in uh, somehow uh, successful way. Okay, so why 
cannot be as precise as weather prediction. And that's our, the focus of uh, my talk today. This was a nice nature perspective in 218, so before COVID, okay, in which uh, some scientists try to view in a, in a future perspective, which can be considered as the future epidemic forecast systems, okay? And obviously, he tried, it was the, it is now the big data era, we have a lot of tools to gather information, but obviously we need models, okay? As Richardson had some equations, it's not only data, we have to rely also on equations. So, what's the focus? Obviously, to decrease the impact of an epidemic. I mean, the focus of having this kind of uh, computer epidemiology or computational epidemiology, sorry, or network epidemiology is to decrease the impact. Solving these questions, when will an outbreak occur? Or when is more probable? Where it will be located at? And especially how fast the infections will spread, if they spread, and which is the intervention policies that are best suited to stop or mitigate at least an epidemic. Okay? And these are the, the, the big, big questions. So let me start by the prehistory of network epidemiology, which is the beginning. And I think that most of you in a usual age will know here in this auditorium, but especially now after a COVID uh, era, know what was the beginning of epidemiology. It was these simple models that are compartmental models one of the first, not the first, because the first one was uh, by Ross to, for malaria, but one of the first was developed in 1927. So more or less the same as Richardson, okay? It was almost 100 years ago. And these two guys, Kermak and McKendrick, by the way, no mathematicians, no physicists, a chemist and a physician, a medical doctor, working on communicable diseases, tried to uh, capture what they observe in reality with mathematics by assuming that if you have a population, you can have different states assigned to each individual in a population. And in their very simple model, SIR, these states are susceptible, infectious, and recovered. And individuals perform transitions between these states, so for instance, a susceptible in contact with an infectious with some probability lambda, goes to infectious, and an infectious with some probability mu is recovered with some immunity, and he cannot pass again. He cannot contract the, in the infection. Obviously, this is a very, very simple model, okay? Okay, so the important thing about these models, not only this, is that they, after some years, they realized that mathematically they could derive one important number, okay, from this model. And this number, is an expression as a function of the parameters of the model. In this case, only two parameters, but if you develop more complicated models, you have more parameters, is the basic reproductive number. And the basic reproductive number is defined as the average number of infections that a single infectious individual, say me, makes in a population full of susceptible, say you, okay? So how many infection, infections I will do during my infectious period, okay, in a population fully acceptable. And this is a very important number, and obviously, it, uh, it, because it is related to the epidemic transition. If you have a pathogen in which this R0 is less than 1, the pathogen will not propagate, okay? There can be some infections, but finally, it will die. If R0 is larger than 1, then the epidemic will appear. And the more larger than 1 is R0, the larger the epidemic will be. Okay? So it's what we call a bifurcation point from the, from the point of view of nonlinear systems. And from the point of view of statistical mechanics, if you go to, the inf to, a, to a population of individuals and make agent-based simulations, for instance, it's a critical point. Okay? At the end, we have this phase diagram. This is the basic reproductive ratio. Before one, no epidemic. After one, you have the active phase. Very good. And the important thing is that it's not a mathematical construct only. It is a mathematical construct divided from model, but you can measure it from data. Because looking at the initial stages of an epidemic, you can assign a number to different diseases. Okay? So nowadays we know that, for instance, SARS have more or less a reproductive 
a basic reproductive number of three, four, the initial one, okay, the original strain. We say that mums have around 10, measles is very, very, very infective, has 18, etc. We can categorize these uh, transmissible diseases because of this number. Okay. Nice. You can measure this and you can calculate it for many models. But the other nice thing is that it allows you, once you have it calculated, at the end what you see is that this number is the product of three important ingredients, which is the time that you spend infecting, the typical number of contacts you have per unit time, see, and the probability that after one contact, an infection occurs. Obviously, this has to be with the virus. This has to be with our social, with our social network. And this has to be also with the interaction between the virus and the, and the host. And whatever complicated is this with this number, you will always find these three contributions. Also, once we know the number, we can focus on the different measures that you can implement in order to decrease this number. Because if you have an R0 with, let's say, 3, you have to, to decrease these numbers by a factor 3 in order to have R0, the new R0, equal to 1, and go to the absorbing phase. Okay? For instance, if you want to act in P, obviously, to reduce the probability, you have to increase prophylaxis, for instance, masks. Okay? If you want to increase, to decrease C, what you have to do is to implement some confinement. You have to reduce the typical contacts individuals make in a population. And if you want to reduce T, you have to make this test, okay? Test, treat, treat, and isolate policies in which what you have is, if you have an, an individual and this is the infection, then what happens is this, uh, this trend, the viral load increases, the, our, our immune response increases, and so the inflammatory symptoms as well, and then immunity is uh, achieved. And this, in the lens of an SIR model, what we have is this, uh, this uh, diagram, okay? Look that symptoms are developed when the immune response is high, when the inflammatory response is high, but you are still, and this happens for all the virus, infectious before developing symptoms. So if you make a test here, what you have is that you make positive, because you have symptoms, you make a test, it is positive, and you isolate, you have removed all this window, all this window here of infectivity, so reducing this. But moreover, if you implement contact tracing, okay, what happens is that you go to other people that still is not developing symptoms but have been in contact with you, and then you reduce more this time. Okay? So this is a nice way to explain the uh, different, uh, different properties. Okay. Another thing is herd immunity, when you implement vaccination. Okay, in this case, you have a population okay, with some R0, and our focus is to vaccine a fraction of individuals so that this R0 multiplied by the fraction of population that is still not vaccinated is equal to 1. Okay? And it's very simple, obviously, to derive the expression for FC. And let's say if R0 is around 3, you know that 66% of the people should be vaccinated. If F0 is larger, for instance, R0 goes to 7, then you know that nearly 90% of people need to be vaccinated. What happens when you have some vaccine efficacy? You can also use the R0 to explain. Then not all the fraction of vaccinated people is uh, successfully immunized. And then the fraction turns to be this number. And the problem is that this number, if alpha is less than 1, can be larger than 1. So a fraction larger than 1 means that there is no herd immunity. Okay? So it's very nice to explain how to implement measures. And if you have a model, you can start doing calculations about how is the uh, number, what is the number of people you need to immunize, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay? But it has a lot of limitations. The first is that it assumes that all societies are identical. In Brazil, in Spain, in Italy, we are all identical. And here you have a map about the estimations of Red Zero of the first COVID wave in Europe, and you notice that it's absolutely wrong to assign a single number to each country. Not only to each country, to each region in a country, to each city. I mean, societies are not identical, so we cannot assign a single number to a, to a virus. It's nice to have a number, but it's not true. Another, mainly, another limitation, we assume that 
All the individuals in a population are identical, so there is no heterogeneity in our social activity, or that populations are closed and independent, which are wrong, and many other limitations, of course. Let's focus on the second one, which is identical individuals with no heterogeneities. We know that we are not identical, and we have measured, in fact, that we are not identical in the terms of number of contacts per day, which is a very interesting number in R0, right? We can define, we can mathematically, ideally, represent our interactions as a network, okay? And in a network, what we have is that each individual is in contact with a different number of, of individuals. And this is the birth of network epidemiology. Now, the, qu the question is not what is R0, because R0 is not a number that you can use for a population. Now, the important thing is, given a population, or if you want, given a network, what is the minimum infectivity that a pathogen should have in order to trigger an epidemic? And this number turns to be depending on the network that you have, on the population that you have, okay? So, this is the concept of epidemic threshold, okay? And you can calculate it, and if you take the topology of a graph, very large graph, what you find is that this threshold, this epidemic threshold, is inversely proportional to the largest eigenvalue of the matrix A, which defines who is in contact with whom. Matrix A is just a, num is just a matrix, very simple, in which you have a zero entry if these two elements do not interact, of a one element if two elements interact. If you calculate the spectral radius of this matrix, you obtain the epidemic threshold. Okay? If you want, you can express it in a more compact way, which is uh, defined in terms of the average connectivity, if you want our average sociality, and the second moment of this degree distribution that tells you the probability that in a network a given individual has K contacts. Typically, if you think in about, about a random network, not a real network, what you have is a Poissonian distribution with a single peak around the mean. The problem in our case is that many networks, social and technological especially, are scale-free. That means that this P of K is not anymore a Poissonian distribution, but it's a power law distribution with a large number of people having few connections, a small quantity but significant people, uh, number of people have really, really large number of contacts. And this makes this quantity goes to infinity if we are with a very big network, okay? And this is the problem because we have these guys that are the halves that makes this increase a lot so that the epidemic threshold vanishes. Okay. What happened then is that if you have two networks, imagine that you have this scale-free network and a random network, and you have the epidemic diagram, are totally different. The yellow one is for the scale-free network, and the blue dotted one is for the Erdos range. Here we have a clearly epidemic threshold. Sorry. Sorry? Not exponentially, it's a power law. This is uh, the expression for this uh, equation, for this distribution is so it's not an exponential decay, it's a power law decay. And there are many, many, many examples of networks in which you have this power law distribution. Sorry? Can you give an example? The internet. The internet. Biological system? Yes. For instance, in the, in the brain, you have the activity, the, the functional. No, but there are more. I mean, you have a, a, a list. No, but in bio, more biology, yeah. Gene regulatory networks, for instance, also display this, and also in many scales. Um, population. Other populations, for instance, in social systems which are interested, if you measure the activity in, a, in, a, in an event with uh, 
with, uh, with this, um, uh, with wearables, then you find also this, uh, this degree distribution. So typically you find that many people have few contacts, but there are a very small quantity of individuals which are here in the tails of the distribution that have many, many, many contacts, okay? In fact, this is at the core of super spreading events that happen to be in COVID-19, but... Okay, so if you take two networks, one random graph, which is not realistic, okay, Poisson and one power law, you find these two different uh, epidemic diagrams. One with a clear epidemic threshold and one with some threshold that vanishes, or at least is very, very, very small, because of this quantity is being very large in the network, in the power law network, while this quantity is almost the square of this one in the Poisson distribution. So it can be the case that you have a virus in this area, and if you put a virus just with a lambda in this area, what happens is that for the erdos rng network, the initial number of individuals which is infected vanish in time, while for those in, for those, uh, in a network, in a scale-free network, what happens is that with the same number of initially infected individuals, you have a steady state, you have an epidemic. The initial infected individuals increase in time, exponentially in fact, and, st and establish in a steady state. So this is very, very important because R0 is not anymore a nice quantity in order to go to a special population and a network structure. R0 can be less than one, but R0 is calculated in a mean field way. If you go to a population, the same in with a virus with a lambda that gives R0 less than one can spread if provided that network topology is heterogeneous enough, okay? And this was very important because it explained for the first time why the virus, I love you, performed this cascade of infections in the early, well, in the early years of this century. You know that the, this uh, virus, the I love you virus, was, well, this is an article of 2020s. I love you, Vero. How a badly coded, totally badly coded, computer virus caused billions of damage and exposed vulnerabilities, which remain 20 years on, remain, so still circulating. This, this virus was made by this Onel de Guzman in Philippines, okay? And he, he intended, he was a computer scientist a student, and he wanted to steal the password of the internet access of the neighbors. Imagine the power of this virus, okay? What happened is that the network, the internet, is a power law distribution with gamma 2.2, which means that it's very, very, very heterogeneous, have a lot of hubs which are really, really largely connected. So even if you put an initial seed, this virus, which infects many, infects few, few computers, it will spread around the world. And in fact, it remains, okay? So this paper was the first one that realizes that the structure of interactions, the network, was as important as the characteristic of the virus, or at least as important, okay? This is a paper that has a lot of citations, and more importantly, it opened here the field of network epidemiology, and this is now, nowadays the number of papers, the production of papers relating network and epidemics. Obviously, here you have a jump because obvious reasons that I want to explain. Okay, second thing which is also important, the assumption of R0 that the populations are closed and independent. Okay, this we know is not, is, not, uh, is not true because mobility plays a really important role. And why mobility is so important? Well, it was not so important if you think about centuries ago, okay, when the time spent for traveling from one place to another was much, much, much larger than the time spent for a virus to infect you and kill you, for instance, okay? So it took centuries to, for communicable pathogens to go from one continent to another, and here you have a, a, it's a nice example, okay? It's not, not, not a nice, ex sorry. <laughs> sorry, Fernando. <laughs> it's not nice because it was really, really huge. Um, uh, it was a disaster for Europe, especially. It was the bubonic plague in Europe. But if you think, 
that it took almost five years to go from here to here. Okay? It started in Turkey, Greece, and progressively started to spread around Europe, and it took five years. There are books that tell that there are boats that apparently, with all the people healthy, departed from some harbor here, and was, this boat was found totally in a random place with everybody totally dead. Okay? So, because the time it took for the infection to spread was much shorter than the time associated to mobility. And these scales were related in this way. The problem is that these two scales are not related in this way anymore. It's the other way around. Now the time we take to make a trip around the world is much shorter than the time it takes to the virus to start the infection in our body and propagate to other places, okay? So that's the point, that's, that's why mobility is so important. This is an example of the first SIRS. This is another example of influenza H1N1 in 2009. And this is obviously the case of coronavirus, that it took one month to cover the, all the continents in the world, okay? So it's... Our mobility, it's our fault, okay, so to say. Our increased mobility favors and induce, introduce another ingredient into the models that have to be taken into account, okay? Okay, so what we do in this, uh, in this area? Okay, we rely on some kind, what a physicist called reaction diffusion models, okay? Or if you want, metapopulation models. And in a metapopulation, you have a network, okay, composed of nodes, but the nodes are not computers, not individuals, not animals, are geographical places. They can be urban areas in a city or cities in a region or region in a country, depending on the level of description you are interested in, okay? Or you can take into account a lot of scales if you want. You can, you can do it multi-scale. And inside each patch, what happens is that people live, react, interact, and propagate the virus, and sometimes they can change location. Okay, so they make this reaction inside the patch, diffusion across the patch, and the diffusion is related with these links that you have here that tell you the possible destinations of the individuals of each living in each patch. Okay? It's a very, very simple framework in which you can incorporate many, many ingredients of real life. Not only social interactions, but also mobility, demography, socioeconomic status. I mean, you can do a lot of things, and this is what I wanted to show. Well, as soon as we have the first real data about mobility, about real mobility around the world, many papers appear. These are very three nice papers about how to incorporate real data into metapopulations models, okay? And nowadays, what we are interested is how real mobility patterns in a city, in a city, okay, affect the spread of a disease. And the thing is that we cannot think mobility in a city as a diffusive process, because it is not. Especially in a big city like Sao Paulo, then you go to the place, you work, you have lunch very close, and then go back home. Okay, so you make this recurrent real and recurrent mobility, commuting patterns, if you want. Here you have a city. You know which city it is? No? It's Medellin. We have three Colombians here. So this is Medellin, and you have the origin and the destination in the early morning, in the afternoon, and the evening. And obviously, origin and destination are the same in the in the, during the day, okay? Okay, so we have to take into account commuting patterns in order to have a reaction diffusion dynamics that they incorporate this not diffusive but commuting activity of people. So we have, for instance, this uh, model in which we have sub-movement, interaction, and finally the return to the home place. And this is something that start and start. We call it MIR model. And this is a very interesting model, and I want to show you some of the possibilities that are open. But first, let me explain a little bit the basic model in terms of equations, OK? Few equations. So inside each patch, we have reaction, reaction uh, process. Can be an SIS, can be an SIR, whatever. And after this reaction, we have the diffusion. The diffusion, as you know, takes place in a metapopulation in which we have the patches and we have the connections. 
So what happened is that all agents here are assigned a residence, okay, that's why they are colored according to their home place. And obviously they have a dynamical state. If we have the simple SIS model, then you have two states. And at the very beginning of each day, each agent has a probability P of traveling where? Okay, as dictated as the, in the topology. Okay, we have some probability transitions from one patch to another that we construct from data. Okay, here we have data entering not only here because of the interactions, but also in the mobility. So we have the probability that a person here moves to here is encoded from real data uh, about a city. Okay, finally, they change location, they interact, they change the dynamical, st uh, dynamical state, and finally, they come back home and start another day. This is the minimal, the minimal model, okay? And with this minimal model, it's easy to construct the basic equations that are really, really simple. Let's focus on the SIS model, in which in the infected individuals come back to the susceptible compartment, okay? Not to a recovered one, because it's only one variable. This is for, for diseases that uh, do not confer the immunity. And in this case, what we focus on the fraction of individuals that are infected in a patch I. So the fractions tomorrow are the fraction of infected today that don't recover, plus the fraction of people that is acceptable times the probability of contagion. And in all these models, this quantity contains the social, the social patterns of interaction. Here we have two possibilities of being, being infected in your, own, in your home or being infected because you have moved. And in any case, the probability of infection is just the product of all the possible events of contagion because of people that visit your, the same place, like here, we belong to different places, so we have different probabilities brought by the people from their home residence, okay? And if you consider this number that depends also on mobility, what you have is a set of equations like this one, which is very simple for the SIS. And the important thing is that these equations, being so simple, incorporates epidemiological parameters, demographical parameters, mobility parameters, and the possibility of a control parameter in which we measure the importance of mobility, okay? And this is, this is the point. So if you develop this, you have to validate, and for this we consider synthetic metapopulations, which are not real metapopulations, okay? And we observe that these kind of models work very well compared to AM-based simulations. That's okay. The thing is that if we have a model if we have an equation that agrees with uh, numerical agent-based simulations, we can do mathematics and we can calculate, for instance, things that are very, very important for people working with real epidemics, like the epidemic threshold. Remember that the epidemic threshold is the minimum infectivity that a pathogen needs in order to trigger an epidemic, right? In this case, if you work with this equation, you find that given a population with some heterogeneous demographic partition and some mobility patterns encoded in this matrix from data, we find that the epidemic threshold is again proportional to the spectral radius of a matrix. But this matrix that before was the adjacency matrix, it was a really simple matrix of zeros and ones that tell you who interact with whom, now is not so simple. Now it's what we call the mixing matrix. And the mixing matrix have, this is the most simple mixing matrix, have the interplay contain the interplay of where people live, where people go, and how people interact in the place, okay? And this is important because you can act on different ingredients in order to decrease the spectral radius of your city and increase the epidemic threshold because the epidemic threshold, when it's increased, increase the ability of the city to not having an epidemic, okay? It's important also that it contains three terms, one, two, and three, each of them having the three basic contagion events that can happen in this metapopulation, or being infected in your home, or being infected by a visitor in your home or in his home, or being infected by another people in a different place. Not his home, not my home, okay? Okay, when you go to real cities, okay, and you go to Cali, for instance, because we have data, it was our original data, you will understand why. What happened is something really, really, really unexpected. You expect that the more you move, the easier for the virus to spread. Well, it's not. 
Here you have the degree of mobility from zero mobility to total mobility, and you see that this is the epidemic threshold. And what you expect is something like this. But what you obtain is that for very low values of mobility, the epidemic threshold increases, so the city is more resistant to epidemic, and then you have this decrease. We can explain it mathematically. We know why it happened, okay? And it happens because of the precise topology of the city at work. Not only the flow in a city, but also where people live. And we derive the expression mathematically, and we obtain, and this is something that resembles that you have a theory, and, you have, and from the theory, the theory tells you, okay, this is something that is, you can explain. But there is also other possibility which is totally different, which is that the epidemic threshold always grow. Well, we didn't move a lot. We went to Bogotá and Medellín, and we find this phenomenon, okay? Which is epidemic detriment for all the range of mobility. And this is what something unexpected that can be explained in simple terms when you use mathematics. We just opened the path to this kind of, uh, to this kind of uh, studies, and in fact, we repeat the, the study for many, many cities in this, in this work, but the take-home message is that there is no single measure that is good or not. It depends on when, especially where, you apply this measure. If you apply it in a city with a given structure of interactions, can be good or can be bad. I mean, you can think about first of the patient. The same thing we need a personalized medicine, we need to think about where we are going to implement, you have to need to think in, in personalized uh, containment policies. Okay, well, there are some references. I want to focus now on this, which is related to the use of this kind of equation, of this kind of model to face the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS in Spain. And, well, among all the questions now, we focus on how fast the infections will spread. And this is something that we invest a lot of, a lot of time. And we were personally very, and Christina knows, personally involved in trying to implement closure in Spain for many, many, in many, many ways. And finally, we succeed. And it was based on this model, OK? Well, not in this model. It was a refination. Uh, sorry. <laughs> this, this is unexpected. OK. So. This is more or less the trajectory of the epidemic in Spain. So no, apparently nothing happened here, then it starts to increase exponentially. Some measures are implemented here, and finally the total closure is implemented at the, at the end of, uh, of March. So the answer was, okay, we have few data. Can we model the epidemic evolution and the impact of contention measure? We are going to focus only on the first question. The model is very simple. It uh, contains this part, okay, which contained for the very first time the infectious asymptomatic um, compartment, so people that is asymptomatic but still infects, which is something controversial at that time, but that now is something that we know. At that time it was discussed by everyone. And also, uh, apart from this epidemiological dynamics, we incorporate some, uh, some other compartments related to hospitalization, the clinical compartments, because we need it in order to, in order to assess is this evolution we're going to overwhelm the hospitalization, especially in critical units, okay? So after this modification, you see that this is a more elaborated model. You can think about also in a further compartmentalization of society. So we decide to incorporate three different uh, age groups, young, old, and elderly. Why? because of two reasons. One, because the, so the, the mobility and the, so and the sociality of these groups is totally different, okay? And second, because while for young people, typically they go to recovered, so the path in this, com in this, com in this uh, compartmental model is dominated by this, for elderly was dominated by this, okay? So it was two big reasons to make this this compartmentalization. This is also how people interact depending on the age, who interact with whom according to the age. We have data from different countries and we can apply it to Spain. We have also data about the mobility and where people live in Spain provided by the Institute of National of Statistics. And finally, what we did was to construct the modeling which as usual, 
the important thing is here, I want, to, I want to explain the details, but it's the core in which all the terms associated to social contacts, mobility, etc., are incorporated. Okay? And after all, what you do is uh, to consider these equations, and once you have the equations, you have to consider which are the parameters. At that time, some parameters were fixed because little information was available, but we knew something, especially from Italy, about mortality and uh, the evolution of, of patients in the critical units. Remember, no vaccine, no treatment at all. It was very catastrophic. And we knew about the first infectious seeds. Obviously, we knew it was a complete, incomplete information, okay? But we can adapt and put some noise in order to, in order to solve this problem. And finally, with this, we have this uh, real data about mobility, for sure, the clinical, data about deaths and critical units. And with this, we can calibrate using Bayesian inference and perform the, the, the forecasting of the trajectory. And this was what we do, okay? What happened, this is what we do, and what happened is that the model reproduced very, very, very well from the very early stage, the diffusion of COVID cases in cities in Spain at the level of cities, okay? We reached to have I, with, with a lot of accuracy, the level of cases detected, considering obviously the over-reporting, okay, because it's, it's uh, the under-reporting, sorry, and also how is, was the capacity of, uh, of hospitalization needed in order to face the, the next days. It was something that we did. This is the model after the final calibration. As you see, it goes very well. It goes very well also at the level of of uh, regions, it goes very well at the level of occupation. So we were very, very happy about this. But we were not very happy, but we use it. And before being very happy, we were trying to convince other people more important than us, much more important than us, to act. Okay? Because here, nothing happened, apparently, but everything was starting to cook. Okay? And what we do is to Okay, we are physicists, we cannot <laughs> do more than establish a web page and show the evolution that was going to happen in some days. This was done just for catching the attention, and we did. I mean, we appear in all the televisions, national televisions, radio, newspapers, and finally some one of the government call us. Hey, what are you doing? No, um, no, no, I know. Many, many people have told about you and the model, and we want to make an interview. We have checked that your model works very well. Okay, but you have data. Yes, we have our own data, because there were no data available at that time. We have a meeting, very formal meeting, obviously online meeting, and after many, many questions, and believe me, it was hard, they, it was like a, an exam. They, convinced, they were convinced that they can use the model, okay? So finally, what we could is to convince to make the first, the, first, uh, the first closure, but the problem was that the first closure was not very, very hard. And the problem came because it was, okay, you cannot go to the bar, you cannot go to the restaurant, but you can go work as usual, okay? It's true that many people decide go not going work and work at home, but not so many people could allow for this. So we ne make next make the next step was to publish this, this, uh, this paper with the prediction of the occupation of critical units in Spain, announcing that it was going to be a very hard situation in two weeks unless we could close, really close the country. And because it was this journal, I think, they finally closed the country in a proper way for two weeks, okay? And this was really a satisfaction because it was not only our model, it was many other people already at that time working hard, all the co-authors of this paper, in fact, trying to convince the government that, okay, economy is important, but the problem was going to be really wrong if they don't close the, 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 the country, okay? Okay, I have to thank here the rest of the team, Alex, David. By the way, this picture was taken in Sao Paulo in another school. David was here. 
uh, Joan Wesley, which is actually now in Sao Paulo working, Clara, Sergi, and Benja. And then go to the next example I want to give you about how these models can be used, okay? And it's these two papers, one very recent. Okay, in this case, we are going to focus on which intervention is best suited to mitigate some uh, disease, okay? Now I know that is, this is going to happen. Okay, forget <laughs> I'm sorry. So the problem we are interested in is this one, vector bone disease. Especially, you know that there are a lot of vector bone disease, malaria, chikungunya, dengue, yellow fever, Japanese fever, well, a lot. But we are focusing on dengue because dengue is one of the most important problems from the uh, in hospitalization, and also because dengue is one of the most important growing burdens because of the climate change. This is, the, this is where the vector Aedes aegypti is located, and the prediction is of growing is this one, and, I, and it can be even worse. So dengue is going to happen not only here in Brazil, Colombia, India, etc., but it's going to go, it's going to happen in North America, it's going to happen also in the southern part of Europe. In, in fact, we have already some, some uh, local cases of vector bone disease because of, of Aedes albopictus in that case. So it is going to be a, a global problem. And, the, and, and it's because global warming, climate change, urban growth, and also because increased mobility. And in fact, if we know where the vector lives and we know how we move, the thing is that can we use this mobility approach in order to do something? Can we test this model in order to control outbreaks? And we approach it again at the level of cities, and we will see how, why. No? We use as compartmental model, let me explain it very fast, the ross mcdonald model. ross mcdonald model is a compartmental model which is really, really simple. You have vectors, you have humans. Vectors and humans can be in two compartments. The compartments are susceptible and infected, and susceptible and infected for the vector. So a susceptible human passed to infected because of the contact with an infected vector, and a susceptible vector turns to infectious because of the contact a bite. Uh, they bite an infectious human, OK? So with these uh, equations, you can solve it, mean field. This is a classical model you find in books, OK? And if you propose the, the equations, what you have is these uh, two equations, two coupled equations, in which you can derive the uh, basic reproductive number, which is this one, okay? okay the, well, in fact, it's the square root of this, but don't worry. And if you want, forget that this is a basic reproductive number. What happens is if this quantity, which is the product of the infectivities, the ratio between humans and mosquitoes, the biting rate to the square, and divided by the typical uh, re recovery rate of humans and mosquitoes, if this quantity is larger than one in your city, then you have an epidemic. Okay? But again, this assumes that all the cities are equal or, even, or the individuals are e equal. Vectors are more or less equal, that's true. So we have to move to a metapopulation model in order to incorporate what happened in actual, in real cities. Okay? So this is what we did. The model is very very, I mean, it's identical. It's, this is the simplest model for metapopulation. You have vectors, you have humans, you have humans that are infected, vectors that are infected. They can move according to this. So according to this, they start to move. They start to move. They start to move. They start to move. And finally, once they have moved, they are infected because of the bites of the mosquitoes, and they change the state, etc., etc. I mean, this is the picture. The, toy picture, and finally they come back home. Okay, so the thing is that you can propose, based on these basic interactions, some equations in which we have the distribution of humans, the distribution of vectors, the mobility, the parameter, the parameter, the mobility parameter that controls how people, how much people move. This matrix that, remember, controls the destinations, the origin and destinations in a city, and the epidemiological parameters that obey uh, a given a given disease in this case dengue, but we were happy to have uh, people from working in epidemiology can 
can calibrate and can assign the, the parameters. So in our case, now we have uh, assigned to each patch a number of infected humans and a number of infected mosquitoes, and the equations are, again, very simple. You have those recovery terms here and those infection terms, and again, as usual, the important things are here. I put the expression just to show you in which we can calibrate and we can include mobility, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's see with this what happened. And what happened is that if you analyze this, remember that this was the epidemic threshold without any mobility, without any social structure. And if you analyze these equations and you make the linear analysis, what you find is an expression which is really similar, but instead of having gamma, what you have is the maximum eigenvalue again of a mixing matrix. But now the mixing matrix is even more complicated than in the case of the SIS. The mixing matrix now is, takes this form. It's the product of two matrices, this one and this one. And I don't want to say anything more. I will show you back in a few minutes, OK? OK, let's apply it. And in Colombia, which, which city is most uh, I mean, in which city dengue is more important? In Cali. OK, so let's go to Cali. And in Cali, what we have is a, a real good data set provided by the, by the city, by the city council, in which we have that almost two million, more than 2 million of people that live in 22 districts. And we have, uh, now we have more than 10 to the 5 trajectories. So you, we can construct the, the mobility matrix. And as they said, dengue is a really, really important problem there. Not only because of the incidence, because the four serotypes, the four main serotypes of dengue are circulating in the same city. Okay, so the probability of catching hemorrhagic dengue is very high. Okay, so we move to this and let's check what happened when we put agent-based simulations with all the mosquitoes and all the two million of people living and moving according to data and our equations. So we consider the city, we consider real parameters. These are the entomological and also epidemiological parameters reported by people there in Cali, working with, uh, with Dengue and Aedes aegypti. And we initiate our not real but synthetic outbreak in this place, which is uh, not a very important place, so to say, because what we want is to see the transient dynamics. It's something that takes a lot of time to, 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 to spread across the city. And this is what happened with agent-based simulations. You see that initially there, are, there is an outbreak which is located in the place here. And finally, when apparently something is going to disappear, it starts to spread other places. And finally, it takes and reaches a stationary state, as expected from this kind of uh, this is, okay? And this is what happened with the equations. So the equations go very well, not only in the stationary state, but also in the transient state. So we were very happy about this. So the agreement is nice because now we can go to this final distribution and consider which is the final constant prevalence of dengue in the city of Cali. There are three places that are mostly affected by this. And if you compare with the real map of dengue cases, it's it's really, it's, really, it's really nice. And these are simulations. I mean, these are simulations, sorry, and this is the iteration of the equations. The thing is that we can go even further not doing any integration of the equations, OK? We can try to assess the epidemic risk of each area by just looking at the equations, nothing more, without any simulations. Now, yes, now I showed you the matrix, OK? So Remember that the epidemic threshold is dominated by this spectral radius of this matrix. And this matrix, now yes, is the product of two matrices. The first matrix tells you the contact rate that a person, a healthy person from a patch I, have from mosquitoes of patch J that are infected. And the patch, and the second matrix tells you the contact between healthy, so to say, free of vectors, mosquitoes in patch I with infected people in patch J. So, because it's the product, obviously, what tells you this product is the contact of healthy people of, of patch I with infected people of patch J. Obviously, here there is the intermediation of 
vectors of all the possible patches that they can visit, I and J. OK, so we can do and say, OK, this is the contact rate per unit person. So if we multiply by the total population, what we have is the epidemic risk associated to an area because of the infection of people in other areas, right? And the thing is that it works really, really well. And this, apart from the agreement, tells you the importance of the structure of mobility and the structure of where people live, the structure of the demography, in order to consider the epidemic risk in a given region, in this case, in a city. Okay? And it's because only dominated of why people, where people move and where people live. Okay? Okay, next step, and this is the final one. Can we help? And this is, okay, we have something that really works. Apparently, works at the level of the city, okay? So can we help? And we heard about this World Mosquito Program that uh, operates across the world, okay? This is a non-profit organization, and they operate in Cali. And why is the World Mosquito Program? Okay, what they do is a biocontrol technique, which is not so developed, but it's not, uh, I mean, this is something that is uh, state of the art, okay, in biocontrol, which is the use of Volvacia. Do you know what is Volvacia? How many of people here know Volvacia? One, two, three. <laughs> okay, Volvacia is a bacteria that lives in many arthropods, but in these insects, they, I mean, they are. In the wild type, they have no they have no Volvacia, okay? And the th what they do is they take mosquitoes, wild type, from the from the from the city, from its place, and take the eggs, and in the lab inject this Volvacia, this bacteria. And then what they have is that mosquitoes, new mosquitoes are born, they carry Volvacia, and that's all. Okay, it's not all. The good thing there are two big news, to good news. The first thing is that why for wild-type mosquitoes, you have some probability that when they bite a susceptible, healthy person, this person is infected. For Volvacia carrying mosquitoes, the probability of infection is zero because the virus cannot develop inside the mosquito and then transmission is almost zero. Okay. But the problem is that well, you have to do it in the lab, put the eggs, and that's all. And what happened next? Okay, what happened next is that these mosquitoes compete biologically, ecologically, with wild-type mosquitoes. And then the second big news, good news, appear. If you make the mating matrix, what you see is that when two, obviously, when two wild-type mosquitoes, female and male, meet, they have these descendants. They are wild-type. If two Volvacia carriers, female and male, meet. The descendants are, the offspring is also carry Volvacia. Nice. But the very good news is that when a female and a male, female carrying Volvacia and a male that does not carry Volvacia meet, the offspring have Volvacia. And even better, if a female of wild type meets a male carrying Volvacia, there is no offspring. So, you don't need equations, right? We don't need to write equations. But if you, if you read equations, if you, you can go to Lotka Volterra equations and you put this term for the competition, I mean, and obviously for the losing of wild type mosquitoes uh, against Volvacia, what you have is even if you put a very small amount of Volvacia mosquitoes in a population, then in the long run, Volvacia carriers will dominate the population. OK? OK, so we can incorporate these two equations, if you want, and we want, into the, into the, in our mathematical uh, framework for the spread of disease. Now, we have three vector variables. Before, we have only one, the infected mosquitoes. Now, we have the mosquitoes that are wild type, the mosquitoes that carry Volvacia, and the infected mosquitoes, obviously wild type, because otherwise, they are not infectious. Okay, and we, if we put them together, we have this set of equations. Okay, forget, these are the two important terms of, uh, for propagation. You already know. And let's see what happened with this containment. Okay, so this is the city of Cali, and this is a free propagation from a small seed. Okay, and you reach the stationary state. 
in the fraction of humans across all the city that are infected in the long run. Now you think that in this uh, we can act at a given time, we made an intervention. Okay? The intervention consists in putting some eggs of this Volvacia in the different places. Let's think we have enough eggs and enough people, okay, because you have to go to the place, you have to go to the schools, you have to do a lot of field work in order to do this, because it's not cheap in time and in money. Imagine that we have money to make immunization of all the patches. Obviously, what happens is that the incidence goes to zero. In the long run, you have to wait more or less, but the incidence will go to zero. Now, imagine the realistic situation in which you don't have money and you have to invest in particular areas, in particular districts or comunas. Then we go again to this uh, web page, and what they say at that time was that they were acting in Comuna 1, 18, 19, and 20. Let's see, according to the model, what's going to happen. And if you act in Comuna 19, there is some mitigation, but you don't see nothing. If you act in Comuna 18, sorry, 20, yeah, mitigation is better. Only in Comuna 20, eh? okay, not 20 as, uh, and, and, the, and the former one. If you go to Comuna 1, yeah, much better, it seems so. And if finally, if you go only to Comuna 18, you find this. Okay, this is nice, but not so good. I mean, you pretend to not suppress dengue, because it's impossible for sure, but mitigate quite a lot. So the reason for going to this Comuna probably is because it was easy to access the, the places. Okay? But you see that in terms of mitigation, it's not very, it's not very nice. Can we do something? OK, let's go to our matrix, our mixing matrix. Our mixing matrix provides the, the risk of contraction dengue between different human-to-human uh, -human mediated by vectors. If we look not to the values of the, of the entries, but to the eigenvectors, especially to the dominant eigenvector of this matrix, and we look to the dominant eigenvector, because the dominant eigenvector is the associated to the largest eigenvalue, and remember that the largest eigenvalue is that which controls the epidemic threshold. If we go to this, to this uh, eigenvector, what we see is that clearly, clearly, for the values of P, etc., Comuna 13 is the one which is more important in terms of probably mitigation. So what happens if we put mitigation in 13? If we go to 13, mitigation is really large. OK, okay now think that you have more money, and you have money for not only for 13, but also for 13 and another one. And you say, OK, let's go to the second entry. Okay, here, because the color code is uh, very bad, you don't see, but the second one is 21. 21 is the second district, which is the most important in the eigenvector. OK, you can do it, and the third one is 16, OK? This three. This is the second, and this is the third. OK, if you go to 16 and 21 separated, not considering 13, separated, only one, you see that the mitigation is not so high, but it's okay. But if you, we mix 13 with the second, 13 and 21, so we implement in 13 and in 21, what happened is, okay, very nice. But the good thing, that the nice thing that happened is that, okay, why not the first and the third? Why not? If you do the third, the first and the third, you have this. Why? <laughs> it's again counterintuitive. Because when you assign the immunization to the first one, you are indirectly immunizing people that travel to 13. So many people, surely from 21, travel to 13 that are indirectly immunized. So what do you have to do in order to establish a ranking? OK, once you have removed one, calculate the matrix, the restricted matrix, without patch 13. And if you do this, effectively, the most important is 16. And you can do this and establish a ranking. Okay? The nice thing is that after talking with these people, discussing this, they are very interested in the field, obviously, 
not so interested in this mathematics, they could make this uh, immunization in patch 13 and, six and 16. So let's see. I mean, maybe mathematics will help. It seems so, OK? But let's see. So just to finish, I want also here thank the real hunters of mosquitoes, which are Eliana Arias from Uni University of uh, Universidad del Valle in Cali, was my former PhD student. Daddy Soriano was also former PhD student. Al Adriana, another former PhD student. I exploit my PhD student and they leave, so they are former or a PhD student always. And just to finish, some some conclusions, some take-home messages. So the main focus of network epidemiology is to consider classical mathematical epidemiology and introduce in a clever way, I think we try to be clever or wise, the high resolution data that we have about social life, about mobility, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And try not to go to agent-based simulations because this is easy. But you, once you have an agent-based simulations that, ha that happens to be good, the problem is that you cannot ask the agent-based simulation what's going, what the hell is happening in your simulation. You need mathematics. And in this sense, provides with useful analytical tools. Not only epidemic thresholds, but also this mixing matrices that contains these many ingredients and the interplay between these ingredients. I think I have shown that it's nice for forecasting, but this is only, at least in my view, valid when you are in the early stages of a disease. Okay? Once the diseases have progressed, we have problems. But in the early stages, like in the case of COVID, these models are really, really good. And also good for, for designing interventions. I have shown you that are especially good when you have scarce resources and you want to know where and possibly when you have to act in the and with, in this case, with uh, Wolbachia or vaccination or whatever kind of intervention you have, you have seen. Okay, so I think we are on our way to be as good as weather prediction. But you know, we will never be as good as weather prediction. Why? Some, some, some people know why? You, you know, you, you are not allowed to, <laughs> the students, why? Humans, that's true, because of this. When you have the information about the trajectory of a hurricane, the, the evacuation of a place doesn't affect the trajectory of a hurricane. When you have interventions because of something observed and you want to act in the population, population react, and react in many ways. Some are in this side, they want health, they want to act, they want to contribute, they cooperate with the global good, which is health. And others, I don't know who is this guy, uh, and others try to Construct these conspiracy theories, etc., etc., etc. So that's why we will never be as good as weather prediction. But we can try. At least we can see if we can approach and also convince these guys in order to collaborate. So thank you very much. Thank you. This is a very nice talk. So, uh, questions? Thank you. Uh, amazing talk. Um, I was wondering regarding the dengue model. The dengue model. Mm -hmm. When you treat with Wolwakia one uh, one region, you completely uh, eradicate the possibility for that region to infect. Yes. Have you tested something about when when the 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 infectivity is not doesn't drop to zero? Because the measure is something other than Wolwakia, like uh, like anti-pesticides and stuff like that. Yes, but 
I mean, you, the thing is that you have the same situation in the sense that the hierarchy of rankings will be more or less the same, okay, in the case of Cali. But it can be, it can be different in other cities in which the second, third, and fourth place are not so clear, okay, because of what you say. If you don't go to, to total eradication, then you can have a different ranking because of the not indirectly solving the problem in other patches. But yes, we have tried, we have tried. And in fact, this is something that you have to do because this is totally ideal. I mean, this is just to show that you can construct a ranking, but even if you put Volvakia in these places, it will take very, very long time to, uh, to take over the wild type population, for instance. Or if you go to a real area in Cali, these comunas are really large. So you have to go to each, each point in which mosquitoes can grow, and there are millions and millions. You won't eradicate this. So this is something that we do when we go to, to real data. And the basic conclusion, conclusion is the same. Same, 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 okay. same. Thank same you. because the hierarchy will be the same. What we need is more data in this case, uh, detailed geographical data for sure, okay? Because uh, comunas are really large. But, okay, it's a first proxy. Hi, uh, so first, thank you, thanks for the presentation. Thank um, you. I was wondering regarding COVID because it's known that COVID vaccines, they don't last forever, like the immunity doesn't last mm -hmm. forever. So uh, I was wondering about the SIR model and usually the removed people don't get back to being success susceptible to the mm -hmm. infection. So I was wondering if there were studies regarding like secondary COVID outbreaks due to the vaccines being not uh, like, they, they eventually fail and, mm -hmm. you know. There, there are studies about SIRS, SIRS model, for instance, which is the basic model, the basic compartmental model you can use for not uh, long-lasting uh, immunity. And there have been some models in which they calibrate uh, data of different waves. The problem of, I mean, they are. Okay, this is my, my answer. Yes, there. are. Here we, did, we only consider a case in which there is no prophylaxis, but we have also implemented the, um, studies about when it's better to implement the second dose, okay? Because it depends also on the time of the last wave. I mean, this is very important. But two, two comments on, only. Uh, the first is that, for me, the, the, the most uh, challenging scenario is to adapt these models, not only with mobility, contacts, etc., but also with the evolution of virus, which happen to be at a different time scale, okay? And you have the equations, I mean, we have also the equation, we have a lot of mathematical theory in order to, 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 to construct. We have also data, because we have networks of, uh, of genotypes and phenotypes of this virus, the, for instance, for the H1N1, okay, a long history. So, I mean, this is the, the, the next step. And the second comment, I forget. So, if, uh, sorry. <laughs> See, if, I, if I came back to this thought, but it was nice. <laughs> <but> <laughs> sorry. Thank you so much for your amazing talk. I have a question about if we have any results for the implementation of the model in Cali. Mm -hmm. Do, ha have you checked if, the implementation, have the results you wanted, or we don't have that data yet? So, the implementation for what? For DENG, for this, for Volvakia? Yes. No, no, the model is implemented, and these are the results. But, but do, we have, do we have some results? No, actual, real, in the real uh, world, no, we have to, to have to wait. Because the implementation in the patches is really, really, really long. Not only the takeover of uh, Volvakia in, against the uh, wild type, not only this, is to go to the place, because you have to go to the place, identify the possible uh, focus of, of mosquitoes, go to the schools, and you have to conscientiate people because you need their collaboration. There is a lot of citizen science there as well. So it's a long process. But we think and we convince that this wasn't the, the real places to act because they are central to the the typical life in, in Cali. So if, you, if we make this immunization, sure, it will be better. But we have to wait, we have to wait. Any other question? Yo te oigo. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I have a question about the, you show some equation and they have a parameter, non-symptomatic yeah. peso. Okay. Uh, did you uh, investigate the situation when, uh, and how dangerous is a uh, 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 disease with uh, non-symptomatic people? Yes, we did. Uh, and in uh, fact, this was one of the key ingredients of our model. And, and we received a lot of criticisms at the early stage because we include this, uh, this uh, compartment. And we try to convince people that or from data, it was impossible not to have uh, only symptomatic uh, infections. We have to have this asymptomatic uh, way. Uh, finally, we put it into the model, obviously, and we also calibrate it in order to have how was the percentage of asymptomatic infection that you need in order to observe what you were observing. And it was very close to, to 50, 40 percent, which was actually, actually the case. By the way, in flu, this also happens. I mean, for instance, the presymptomatic infections happens in influenza. This is not of COVID. I mean, many virus, because of uh, evolutionary mechanisms, infect before you have symptoms. I mean, and this is, this is something that is well known, not for now, I mean, for ages. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. I was going to ask you just to um, understand how the Maxine matrix is actually calculated. So I believe that you have some socioeconomic factors that are used to evaluate these metrics. But like, uh, take the example of dengue. What do you use to really get the uh, the features in the, the metrics to like evaluate what regions are more important than, than others? It's just a number of cases, or there's more? Attached no, 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 no. We don't, we don't have information about uh, cases in the mixing matrix. The mixing matrix, you only have information about the mechanisms of infections, the model, mm -hmm. the epidemic model, and how people interact, where people live, and how people move. If you want to go to socioeconomic uh, information, for instance, we can do it, and we did it in the second paper. And we, we made use of a multiplex structure, a multiplex metapopulation, in which you have each patch associated to each socioeconomic status that is in a layer. And then you have some mixing between socioeconomical classes, depending also on the place. So all of this information is what is contained in the mixing, in the mixing matrix, but no cases. Then you go to cases in order to confirm that the information that you have from the, from the eigenvector coincides Obviously, it's proportional to the incidence, to the long, uh, to the steady incidence, okay? Obviously, take into account that dengue is a steady disease. I mean, so you have a steady state, uh, not, it's not an SIR disease or like disease like COVID, for instance, okay? Uh, hello. Uh, nice talk. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, I, I got a little confused because uh, when you started talking about the mobility model that you, you used, the, the epidemic threshold, you had some models that which it went down and some models which went up. Does it mean, I may be interpreting it wrong, but does it mean that sometimes lockdown makes the problem worse? No, 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 okay. no, 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 Perimetral confinement. Not lockdown. Lockdown is okay. I mean, I mean, this. I have the solution for any <laughs> pandemic. Go to the to a to a room, stay alone for 20 days, and everything is solved. I mean, no lockdown is okay. The thing is that if you decide to make this perimetral uh, confinement, so to say, all the people in Bella Vista is our place, Bella Vista, which is a very big area. You can go out, but you cannot visit other areas. This is something that in Spain used to happen, okay? Uh, people from Badalona are confined for 15 days and they cannot move. And this was worse. I mean, it was proven because they, unless they stay at home, if they can move, if the, if the density of population in that area is very large, you increment the, the, the contagions. So that's why it depends on the architecture of demography. But, uh, but in a way, the lockdown is not always complete, you know, it's not always you stay at home perfectly. So mm -hmm. you always go to to your local place in the market, you know, pharmacy. Yeah, yeah, but, so but this 
But in this case, in this case, you have a, a certain degree of mobility, and in this case, because you go, you come from uh, total mobility, is is good. I mean, you always have this tendency. Okay. Okay. Just one small question, if you allow me. Just sure. one small question. Uh, the point is, what I want is to put some more in, in, in some information that I have. I didn't know about the name of Volvacia, but I do remember that a few years back, here in Brazil, there was an experiment in which in a city, mm -hmm. they just poured a lot of, uh, I mean, of mosquitoes in a city that cut them. Yeah? a lot of mosquitoes, and, and it was exactly the same thing mm -hmm. that you s described. That's the case? That's what I, I want know. to know. I Are don't you know. Going, uh, Maybe yes. Going, do you remember, uh, uh, Robert? We have tried to implement Volvacia in the, in the state of Rio de Janeiro. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. It was too much of a problem. Yeah, Rio is... Uh, <laughs> so, so this was an adaptation of this, this first emerged in Australia, actually. Mm -hmm. And they tried to adapt in Rio, but it didn't work. didn't work. Then there was something else in, in the northeastern region, which, which was not with Bobakia, with uh, genetically modified. Ah, okay. yeah, yeah. And uh, obvi this is obviously this works, but it's not sustainable. I mean, you have, you have to put mosquitoes again and again and again. Time. I mean, it's not something that can self sustain. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Any more questions? <laughs> yeah, my question is because in Rio and Brazil we have an em endemic of Zika and chikungunya that is also transmitted by the same mosquito. So can you include this in your model or would it be like the same problem of COVID that you have a lot of new versions of the virus? I don't know. I mean, I know that Volvacia and Dengue interacts, but I don't know if Volvacia and Zika interacts. I think yes, because I read something, but I'm not sure, and I don't, because I'm being recorded, and Fernando is watching. Uh, I don't want to answer your question, because I'm not, because I'm not sure what happened, what happened if the Volvacia leaves the Zika, the Zika, Zika virus, to replicate inside the mosquito, then it's not, it's not working. Yeah, you could, you could. In principle, yes. In fact, for malaria, it doesn't work. For malaria, it was different. Volvacia would uh, make the life uh, span of, mos of mosquitoes uh, shorter. And it was a problem because then you have a lot of population of young adults that make, have more activity. And what happened, <laughs> it was totally absurd, is that increased the level of, uh, of the incidence of malaria. So you, you have to be careful about this. That's why I don't want to, to, to answer, sorry. One minute, and yes. it's not a question, it's a comment. Uh, because you compare with the weather and the weather forecast, and if we're going to get as good as weather forecast. And I have some experience on this, and I want for the young people, the importance of interdisciplinary cooperation. Because if the people expert in weather would not cooperate with the people expert in computer science and artificial intelligence and blah, 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 we wouldn't have this weather prediction. I think it's mandatory that people working in complex networks that are experts in complex networks have a really active collaboration, interdisciplinary, with people that have been working for ages in epidemiology. Yeah, we that do. really know how an epidemia works. And, it's been, and if there is no cooperation, and I have that very, very, very close to my university, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for then you have scientific competition and that will just put us down. It's not going to allow us to get yeah, to the totally weather forecast. Yeah. And that's for the sake of, for the record, because. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm to to totally agree with Christina. And this is something that I think COVID-19 has brought us the possibility of breaking this barrier, because we were forced to communicate each other. And then we have learned, in fact, another possible talk was how a physicist should talk with an epidemiologist because one thing we learned from February to June was this. Not to do models, we, 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 we already knew how to do models, but how to communicate them what the models were giving and also how to understand the questions that they made us. And I think we, we have made a lot of progress. Still, we have to make a lot. 
Well, <laughs> thank you very much thank for you. a very nice, <laughs> wonderful talk. Thank you.